Will someone please help a poor blind man who has lost his precious sight in the service of England? God bless King George. Will any kind friend inform this old sailor in what part of England he now may be? You're on the sea road to Bristol, sir, at the sign of the Admiral Benbow Inn, Black Hill Cove. I hear a voice, a young voice. Give me your hand, my young friend, and lead me to the door. That was the way Blind Pew came to the Admiral Benbow Inn, tapping his way along the sea road one grey, windy afternoon in January, 1773. A fine old sea dog was Blind Pew, and a fine young boy was Jim Hawkins, whose mother owned the inn. I didn't know Jim then, but I was to meet him soon. A good, upstanding lad. My name, by the way, is Silver. Long John Silver. At the time I speak of, I kept a public house in Bristol, for seafaring men as wanted a fire and a glass of rum to warm their salty bones. I was little good for the sea myself, having lost my left leg in a skirmish off the coast of Madagascar in 62, to be sure I could skip around with the aid of a crutch. But my days in the mizzen shrouds were over. Long John was set ashore. It was me who sent Blind Pew to the Admiral Benbow in that day. He carried a message from me and a few old shipmates to a certain Bill Bones. You have a seafaring man at the inn, lad. A man named Billy Bones with a scar on his cheek and a taste for rum. Yes, sir. But he's not fond of visitors, sir. Lead me to him, boy. He'll be glad to see old Pew again. If you please, sir. Captain Bones has given orders that if anyone asks Take me for to him... him, do you hear? Oh! Take me to him or I'll twist your arm until it breaks. Yes, sir. <laughs> I? That'll be Billy Bones now. Lead me into him, lad. Drink and the devil has and for the rest. Yeah, hold the bottle of rum. Hawkins, another noggin of rum here. Captain Bones. Rum, I said. Captain Bones, there's a friend come to see you. Blind Pew. Now, Bill, sit where you are. I can't see, but I can hear a finger stir. What do you want? We want the map, Bill. Flint's map, as we've all got a right to. Share and share alike, as they say. You'll have no share of what's mine. I'll see you swing from the gallows first. That's your answer, Bill Bones? That's Bill Bones' answer, and you can take it back to that one-legged Bill Zerata sent you, to him and Black Dog and the rest of this skulking crew. Business is business, Bill. I've got a bit of paper here for you. Hold out your hand. No. No! Boy, take his right hand by the wrist and bring it near to me. There you are, Bill. The black spot. Aye. You've got till 10 o'clock tonight. Six hours, Bill. A scrap of paper with a black spot on it. Aye, that's all it was. But it did for Bill Bones right enough. That night, old Pew and the lads went back to the inn. Black Dog, Johnny, Tom Morgan, and Dick. In the bar, by the light of a lantern, they found Bill Bones on the floor. <laughs> he saved them the trouble, Bill had. Died of fright. They found Bill's sea chest in his room. The gold coins were there, a jewel or two. But the map was gone. Hughes, someone's been here before us. They've turned out the chest, top and bottom. It's these people at the inn. It's that boy. Oh, I wish I'd put his eyes out. Listen. That's Dick's whistle. There's a coach coming over the hill. Run for it, mate. Oh, no. Over, man. Wait. Old Pew stumbled out of the inn to the road. Come back. Come back. Now the oncoming coach had topped their eyes and came at full gallop down the hill. Johnny, Black Dog, Dick, you won't leave old Pew, mate. Not old Pew. You are. The men were scattered, old Pew was dead, and not a sign of the map. Jim Hawkins had his hands on it now. 
He took her to a certain Squire Trelawney's house, and him and the Squire and a man named Dr. Livesey gave it the going over. Oh, a good lad Jim was. A fine, upstanding, honest young lad. You say, Jim, that the blind man mentioned the name Flint? I'm certain it was Flint, Squire Trelawney. Captain Flint. How did you get this map, Jim? Well, you see, Dr. Livesey, Captain Bones owed my mother for a reckoning of six guineas. I was taking it from his sea chest when I heard the men coming. I grabbed the first thing that came to hand and ran here as fast as I could. Did you catch sight of any of them, Jim? Only one, Squire. A man they called Black Dog. Black Dog. Flint. Hmm. What do you make of it, Dr. Livesey? Well, you've heard of Flint, I suppose. Heard of him? He was the bloodthirstiest buccaneer who ever flew skull and crossbones. Well, suppose this map we have here is a clue to where Flint buried his treasure. Will that treasure amount to much? Amount, sir? It'll amount to this. <laughs> I'll fit out a ship in Bristol Dock at my own expense and take you and Hawkins here along. I'll have that treasure if I search a year. Very well, then. Open the map, Jim. Yes, sir. Now, uh, bring it into the light, Jim. Uh, spread it out on the table. Now, let's see what we have. Hmm. Skeleton Island. Never heard of it. Well, there's the latitude and longitude. Uh, what's that mark there, Livesey, in the center? It's a red cross marking a hill in the middle of the island. Spyglass Hill. Bulk of treasure here. Treasure, sir. Flint's treasure. By the powers, we've as good as got it. Livesey, you must give up your practice. Tomorrow I start for Bristol. In ten days' time, I'll have a ship. The best ship in the harbor, sir, and the choicest crew in England. The squire had no trouble finding a ship in Bristol. The Hispaniola, she was calling as trim a little schooner as ever sailed. Twas the rounding up of the ship's crew that gave the difficulty. But in this matter, as the squire wrote to Dr. Livesey, he had a most remarkable stroke of fortune. Oh, a remarkable stroke. Good news, dear Livesey. I've engaged a crew. All credit is due to one man whom I met by merest accident on the docks here. An old sea dog who agreed to furnish us with a company of the finest salt sailors imaginable. I engaged the fellow on the spot to be the ship's cook. He would be a sailor himself, uh, but he has lost a leg. His name is Long John Silver. <laughs> now, that was a crew, if I do say so. There was myself, of course, Black Dog, Morgan, George, Mary, and the rest. As fine a pack of gentlemen of fortune as ever sailed for treasure. Boys to be trusted, they were. Boys to be counted on. Not a man jack of them as hadn't tasted blood on the high seas or cut a man's throat for a swig of rum. It was a few days later that young Jim come to the tavern at Bristol. Are you Mr. Long John Silver, sir? Such is my name to be sure, lad. And who may you be? Jim Hawkins, sir. Cabin boy on the Hispaniola. Welcome, lad. Harry, a nip of brandy for the lad here. Thank you, no, sir. Squire Trelawney says, sir, that we sail on the morning tide. The morning tide? No, oh, that's good news, lad. Mr. Silver, that man going out the door, he's Black Dog. Hey! Stop him, it's Black Dog. I don't give two coppers who he is, but he hasn't paid his score. Harry, run and catch him. I'll get him. Oh, no, 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 you stay here, lad. Who did you say he was? Black what? Dog, sir. Didn't Squire Trelawney tell you about the buccaneers? He was one of them. So? In my house? Ben, run and help Harry. One of those swabs, was he? Black Dog. No, I don't believe I know the name. Yet, wait. Yes, I've seen the swab. Used to come in here with a blind beggar, he did. I know the blind man. His name was Pew. That's it. That was his name for certain. He looked a shark, too. Oh, see here now, Hawkins. This is a blessed hard thing on a man like me now, ain't it? What Squire Trelawney to think? Here I have this confounded dog sitting in my own house, drinking my own rum, and here I let him give us the slip before my blessed eyes. Now what's the Squire to think, eh? I... I don't know, sir. Well, see here now, Hawkins. You do me justice with the squire, eh? You're only a lad, Hawkins. Ha oh, ha, but you're smart as paint. I could see that when you came in. You couldn't stop him, sir. Not with your... Well... Say it, lad. Say it. Not with this old timber I use for a leg. I'm right. When I was a master mariner, I'd have come up alongside of that black dog and broached him in like a... Uh, but now... It wasn't your fault, Mr. Silver. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. You tell that to the squire. And you know, Jim, 
You and old John are going to get along. Shipmates, eh? <laughs> That's us shipmates. Make ready for sea. Man the captain bird. On top of the flood tide, just at dawn, we up anchored at Bristol Dock. The sails began to fill, and we headed out to sea and Treasure Island. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. Drink and the devil had done for the rest. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. A fairer voyage I never seen. With the days slipping by like the green water past our bow. One night out on deck, a few of the lads and myself were enjoying the soft air in the moonlight. Long John. Hey, George Mary. What I want to know is, how long are we going to take orders from Trelawney, Captain Smollett and the rest? Take over the boat now, I say. We want their wine and pickles. What say, man? Aye, that's what we George say. Mary, your head ain't much account, but you're able to hear, I reckon. Now hear what I say. You'll live hard and you'll speak soft and you'll live sober till I give the word. We don't say no, do we? All we ask is when. When, by the powers, if I was sure of you all, I'd have them navigate us halfway back before I struck. Uh, but I know the kind you are, all of you. You're never happy till you're drunk. So I'll finish with them at the island, as soon as the treasure's on board. Finish with them how? You mean kill them? There's a choice of ways, my lad. Put them ashore like maroons, for one. That would have been Captain England's way. Or cut them down like so much pork. That would have been flints. And what's yours, Long John? Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote right now. Death. We're with you, then. Aye, we're with you. John, you're a man. I will say so, Israel, when you see. And now, Dick Lad, reach into that barrel there and get me an apple to wet my pipe. Here, I'll get it myself. Oh, stow that, John. Let's have a go of the rum. <laughs> One drink will hurt no one. Here we are. You first, John. Thank you. Here's to ourselves and hold your luff. Plenty of prizes and plenty enough. Land ho! Land ho! There she lay in the moonlight, Treasure Island. The white waves licking at our sandy shore. All we needed now was the map from Squire Trelawney, a few days of digging, and a fair wind home. We'd have had it too, and all as rich as kings, if it hadn't been for young Jim Hawkins. Ah, oh, a bright lad, Jim. I learned later that while I was talking on deck that night, Jim was listening, crouched deep in the apple barrel. Oh, a pity I didn't reach into that barrel. A pity I didn't reach in with my knife blade drawn to spare an apple or whatever else was there. That's what they said, Squire. Silver himself owed a death for all of us. You, Dr. Livesey, Captain Smollett, and myself. They're going to kill us on the island. They are, eh? Captain Smollett, what are your orders? I say fight. And so do I, but not aboard ship. We'll have to pick our own place in our own time. Well, how do you plan to manage that, Livesey? Well, according to the map, there's an old stockade and log house in the center of the island. I vote we dig in behind the walls with powder and muskets. So long as we have the map, they'll have to come and get us. I'm for it. What about you, Captain? There are two honest hands aboard assigned to myself. That makes six of us against 19 of them. It'll be a pretty fight, gentlemen. It was a gallant stand the gentleman's party made our later that. Three times we stormed the blockhouse, and three times they turned us back. On the morning of the fourth day, we went at him again. Captain Smollett, there's five of them coming through the stockade. We can't hold out, Squire. Get through the back and into the woods. Where's Jim? Jim? Jim Hawkins? Well, he was here a moment ago. Jim! Jim, where are you? Wherever he's gone, we can't wait here for him. Come on! <laughs> We had the blockhouse now. We had most of their stores and all of the rum. When night came and they had their fill, all hands lay down on the blockhouse floor to sleep. I was sitting there awake in the dark when I heard a noise outside. It was Jim Hawkins coming back to look for his party. 
Dr. Livesey, Squire Trelawney, I've come back. Come in, Jim, lad. Come in. Oh, let me go. No, no, Jimmy, easy, lad. Let go. Stow that racket. Fetch a torch, Dick. We've got a visitor. Who is it? It's Jim Hawkins dropped in to see us. Now I take that friendly, Jim. <laughs> Hand him over. We'll show him who's friendly. Ah, no, now, George, there's no way to treat a guest. Sit down, Jim. Make yourself at home. That's <laughs> all. So, you've come to join up with us, eh, Jim? Well, I've always liked you. You're a lad of spirit. And the picture of my own self when I was young and handsome. Give the lad a spot of rum. I want none of your rum. And I haven't come to join up, Silver. I thought my friends were still here. Did you now? And how did you make that mistake, Jim? Where were you that you didn't know your friends had run out like a pack of scared rabbits? I'll tell you where I was. I went back to the schooner and cut her cable. Huh? You'll never see the Hispaniola again. Why? I sailed her to another island and hid her in a cove where you wouldn't find her in a hundred years. <laughs> Maroons! That's what we are. Marooned on this filthy beach for the rest of our lives. Put down your hatches! So, Jim, you went and cut the Hispaniola's cable. No, we don't take kindly to that, lad. I'm not afraid of you, Silver. You're in a bad way right now. No treasure and no ship either. And if you want to know who to blame, why blame me? I was in the apple barrel the night we sighted land, and I told the squire every word you said before an hour was out. Ah, oh, you hear that, mates? First and last, we've split upon Jim Hawkins. Enough of it, I say. It's time we finished with it. Put away your knife, Dan Murdoch. Hand him over. Avast there. Dan's right. Kill him. Avast, I say. I'm captain here, not you. I'm captain here by election, and because I'm best man by a long sea mile. Now then, I like this boy here. I've never seen a better boy than this. He's more man than any pair of rats in this blockhouse. And if one of you takes a cutlass to him, I'll see the color of his inside crutch and all before he lifts his arm. They were ready to turn against me that night. I could see it in their eyes. Next morning, just at dawn, Dr. Livesey comes up to the stockade under a truce to bandage the wounded among us and treat him for fever. This is not an act of mercy, Silver. I'm doctor now to a pack of mutineers. And I'm just making it a point of honor not to lose a man for King George and the gallows. When the doctor had gone, the men went outside the blockhouse for a council. I knew what they were up to. They were making ready to tip me the black spot. What are they doing out there so long? Why, they're going to throw me off, Jim. Elect a new captain. Now look here, Jim. You're within a half a plank of death. I saved your life last night. And I'll do it again if I can. But look here, Jim, tit for tat, eh? You save old John. I don't know what you mean. Well, it's like this, boy. I'm on the squire's side now. What? Oh, I have a head on my shoulders. I have, and I know when the game's up, I do. When I looked into that bay this morning and seen no schooner, well, I'm tough, but I gave out. This crew here, me included, is on the way to the gallows. But if I had a witness now, like yourself, well, maybe when I get back to England and the court heard is how I saved your life, why, maybe it wouldn't go so hard with me, Jim. Well, I'll do what I can. But no more than the truth. Not a jot, lad. Not a jot. Ah, I know you were the right sort. I said to myself, I said, you stand by Hawkins, John, and he'll stand by you. You save your witness, and he'll save Long John from swinging. Well, I had a foot in both camps now. No matter who won, Long John couldn't lose. After a while, the crew came shuffling back inside the blockhouse. Then Dick come forward, slowly, with his right hand clenched in front of him. I knew what he was holding. It was for me, the black spot. So, I'm deposed, is that it? Aye, George Mary's our captain now. George, eh, well, I call that a mighty fine choice, George. See, the way you bungle this cruise, it could be worse. So I bungle the cruise. From the first to the last, that's what. Aye. We got no boat and we got no treasure. And then there's this boy. Yeah. Well, now, you may be right in some respects, George. We've got no boat, not a present, that is. But this boy here that you're all for killing off, ain't he a hostage? Are you going to waste a hostage, lads? That boy's come in mighty handy already. And if you don't believe it, well, just look here. 
Feast your eyes on this piece of paper, lads, and then tell me I'm a fool. What is that paper? What is it? It's the map. Flint's map, what the doctor gave me only two hours ago. <laughs> It's a map of the treasure. There's Flint's writing. No, lads. Who's your captain? George Berry or me? Long John. Long John. Long John. Long John. Silver forever. It was a map right enough. Dr. Livesey had given it to me that morning. Why? I didn't know. But I took their minds off losing the boat and had saved my skin proper. They drunk themselves full that night, and in the morning, we started off toward Spyglass Hill, the treasure as good as ours. It was late afternoon when we reached the hill. The lads were on ahead, clawing their way to the top, shoving and fighting to be the first to dig for the treasure. But when Jim and me come up, they were standing about a hole in the ground, and there was murder in their eyes. Cause someone had been there before us. The treasure was gone. It's gone! They've beaten us to it! Hawkins, here, take this pistol, lad. Stand by for trouble. Nothing left! Not a guinea! 700,000 pounds was here! And not a guinea left! Well, Silver, you're the man for bargains, ain't you? You're him that never bungled nothing. Mates, he knew it all along. He knew the treasure was gone. Look in the face of him, and you'll see it wrote there. Yeah. Standing for captain again, are you, George Murray? You're a push on lad, to be sure. Mates, listen! We've been done. And there's the two who done it. One of them's this timber-legged fool who blundered us into this, and the other's that young cub I mean to have the heart of. Yeah. Well, mates, what are we waiting on? Yeah. Have at him! Yeah. They started toward us in a body with the cutlasses drawn, and then suddenly there was a musket shot from the woods. <laughs> and Dan Murdoch went down with a ball in his head. <laughs> It was the squire's party, firing on us from the trees. I knew then why they'd given us the map, an ambush. All around us, the muskets were flashing. I grabbed the boy, Jim, and flung him off down the hillside and began scrambling down myself. But before I did, I put a pistol shot where it'd do the most good, into my old shipmate, George Merry. The squire's party did for the lads that day, and when it was over, Jim Hawkins and me went to the beach where the gentlemen were camped. The squire himself was on guard. Is that you, Silver? What brings you here, man? Why, sir? I've come back to my duty, sir. Duty? John Silver, you're a villain and an imposter. But I'm told I'm not to prosecute you. Well, then I won't. But the dead men, sir, they hang about your neck like millstones. Thank you kindly, sir. <laughs> I watched them count the treasure. A little short of 700,000 pounds. Uh, I've even helped them to put it aboard the Hispaniola. And at last, one fine morning, we weighed anchor and set our course for England. Well, that was years ago. And it taught me a lesson you may lay to that. I've lived an honest man since then and a better man for it. The trial, oh, there was no trial for Long John. I was never the man for courts and judges. Always saddened me that did. So late one night, as we stood off a port in Spanish America, I went over the side with a sack of coin I borrowed from the treasure, and I pulled the skiff for the shore. Made it, too. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of... I've often thought of Jim Hawkins since then and wondered how he fared with his share. Oh, he was a fine lad, Jim. A bright lad. An honest lad. Cost me a king's fortune, that lad. <laughs>